Last time on Discover the Word, we started a look at a group of people who show up a lot, you know, over a hundred times in the New Testament, a group that you likely have formed an opinion of. So when I say Pharisees, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Rules. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lots of rules and outward behavior. And yep. perfection. And yep. presenting perfection at all times. And judgment. Mm-hmm. Legalistic. Mm-hmm. The bad guys. Mm, yeah. The bad guys. Mm-hmm. There's even a dictionary entry that if you look up the word Pharisee in the dictionary, comes up a self-righteous person and a hypocrite. Whoa. But what's interesting is when we look at the story of the New Testament in particular, there's a few spots where I think some Pharisees play a positive role in the story. And so I thought it would be fun over these next couple weeks to explore some of those examples of places where maybe the stereotype is helpful at times, but where it's also wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it should be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, Does that sound good? Sounds great. I'm right. excited. Thanks for digging this out for mm-hmm. us. Let's do it. Yeah, and so let's get into part two of this conversation, find out more about the Pharisees, and meet a couple more of them that we find in Scripture that challenge the stereotypical way we think about the Pharisees. Welcome to the Discover the Word podcast, a small group style Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries. And we're convinced that doing this together in community is an important part of our engagement with the scriptures. And that doing it this way not only informs how we read the Bible, but also challenges us as we live our lives as followers of Christ. So around the table for this twist on the stereotypical way that we think about and talk about the Pharisees are Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, Rasul Berry, and the newest member of the group, Vivian Mabuni. As I said last week, no one's leaving, no one's retiring. Marty Hahn and Bill Crowder are still part of the group. We have just expanded the group and we'll be rotating those six into the four chairs that are present in the room. Five chairs, actually, because we always keep an empty chair in sight to remind us that you are here with us as well. And so, the Pharisees. Let's continue this look at a group who stereotypically have been viewed in a negative light and see if there are any more examples in Scripture that maybe break our stereotype. Let's review a little bit before we jump in, because that'll help us as we think through some of these other named Pharisees that we're going to meet. So what did we talk about? Where did we start the conversation? We were definitely talking about the political, Mm -hmm. cultural, historical setting, which really does inform quite a lot of Mm -hmm. the motivations Mm -hmm. of the Pharisees, but it was very politically unstable under Roman rule. We talked about Hellenism, Mm -hmm. the Greek influence during that time, and what does it look like to follow God in an environment that's not ideal? Mm -hmm. And the big pop that surprised me is that the Pharisees, we constantly think of them stereotypically as the bad guys Mm -hmm. in in the New Testament, especially. And and our conversations and looking at various passages and even what Jesus said about them, we began to understand that they functioned from a heart of respect for the law and wanting to keep the main thing the main thing, Mm -hmm. if you will, Mm -hmm. which we understand now is only possible in a relationship with Jesus. But that's where their heart was. And we Mm -hmm. actually ended up looking at Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, in depth and at his apparently sincere seeking of truth and what it looked like. So when I back up and I see that there are some who are hypocritical and inauthentic and legalistic, but the basic heart of a Pharisee is one that who really wants to find and protect the truth. Mm-hmm. And I love how you kind of s- took a step back and say, well, there are some mm-hmm. who are, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I think when we look and zoom out in the New Testament and really even the Old Testament, it's a reflection in a mirror of ourselves. It mm-hmm. totally is. And mm-hmm. so in mm-hmm. the same way that there are some Pharisees who are legalistic and hypocritical, there are mm-hmm. some of us yes. who are as well. But when we look at the specific context, the way that the Bible talks about them, the way the New Testament is a more nuanced and uh, balanced perspective than the 
stereotypical way that we just shorthand mm-hmm. because even mm-hmm. when Jesus, like you said in Matthew 23, before he goes into his seven woes, says, Hey, they sit and see the Moses, mm-hmm. so listen to what they do, unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. So, like, there's this element of that there is a righteousness to kind of go beyond. And then, of course, his interaction with Nicodemus, mm-hmm. there's a lot more in the text that shows a broader view and even a more positive view than the way that it has come down in our common vernacular. Mm. Yeah. And we talked a lot about just even the idea of stereotypes and how stereotypes use language like all and always and Mm -hmm. things like that. And before this first series, if we had said all Pharisees are, we probably would have had some things that we threw in there, Mm. like closed off to what God would have, Mm -hmm. know everything. And we found out really quick that that couldn't apply to Nicodemus because he was both open to God, it seemed, and asked Jesus questions and didn't assume that he knew it all. Mm -hmm. So much so that at the end, he's one of the two people that are not the typical disciples of Jesus Mm -hmm. who end up burying Jesus and showing his body that honor after he's crucified. Mm -hmm. And so the stereotypes are sometimes helpful, but Nicodemus showed that our typical stereotype of Pharisees is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then Vivian, as you talked about, all the instability, the revolts, the influence of Greek culture, which is called Hellenism. So cultural pressures and ideas and values and clothing and words that you use and religious practices, all the things that we think of as culture. So much of that was pushing against what it would mean to be a Jew in that time all the foreign leaders they were under, the political situation. We learned a new word last week, halakha, which is how to interpret the Torah and oral tradition for everyday life. So I thought as we start this new week, maybe we can add a few more layers to who the Pharisees were that might be helpful for us before we jump into a couple more named Pharisees that we see in the story. The first thing that really jumped out to me as I was thinking about the Pharisees and Jesus in particular is that when Jesus talks to them and he critiques them, he's an insider talking to insiders. Mm. How is that different than an outsider talking to a group of people? Very different Mm -hmm. because one, there's built in perspective Mm -hmm. that an insider has about the culture and the norms that they are critiquing Mm -hmm. that an outside person doesn't have, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's just some built-in trust, I would even say, or at Mm -hmm. least respect Mm -hmm. of the understanding that they're bringing in, not knowledge that they heard from someplace else, but that they have embodied their own shared experiences. Yep, so Jesus was a rabbi. He's Mm -hmm. called that by Nicodemus, a Pharisee, when he shows up, which means that Jesus kind of models or embodies Phariseeism and that he's a teacher of the law and he's has followers. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I think Jesus' objective was the closest to the Pharisees. Mm-hmm. I think that wanting people to live their entire lives by God's will, mm-hmm. that was at the heart of what Jesus was after. And that's what the heart of Pharisees were mm-hmm. after. One was going to be accomplished through the law with the Pharisees, but Jesus was talking about through the Spirit. Yeah. Okay. And Jesus actually makes it more intense when he talks about the law in the Sermon on the Mount, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. where he talks about, That's true. you've heard it said, mm-hmm. 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 but I say to you, don't kill mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. someone, don't murder, but I tell you, if what? Truth. If you're angry yeah. or, or yeah. hatred towards yeah, he, someone. He that, scales it out, doesn't yeah, he? You've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery, mm-hmm. I tell you. Mm-hmm. So in a way, Jesus actually makes it more intense yeah. in some places, which has mm-hmm. made people wonder. Thanks. This was interesting to me too. We're going to look at a Hebrew Bible passage, Numbers 15, verses 37 through 40. Could somebody read that? I think there's going to be kind of a fun parallel here to see how Jewish Jesus actually was. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them to make fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue cord on the fringe at each corner. You have the fringe so that when you see it, you will remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and not follow the lust of your own heart and your own eyes. So you shall remember and do all my commandments and you shall be holy to your God. So what are the people asked to do? Put fringes on On their garments. garments. Yep. And that helps symbolize the fact that they are a set apart people group that have followed God and don't follow false idols. Okay. And they're wearing that. And they're wearing symbol, it. Which reminds them all the time. Yep. So could someone read Matthew nine twenty through 21? 
see if anything jumps out. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Mm. Now, until I had ever seen the numbers thing, right. I thought she just grabbed the edge wherever. Right. Mm. But what does she grab? The, the fringe. fringe. Yes, yeah, some translations will say the hem yeah. of his garment. But putting these together, that's, that's interesting. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And just in case that's not convincing enough, someone read Matthew 14, 34 through 36. Alisa, you got that one? When they had crossed over... This is the disciples. They came to land at Gennesaret. After the people of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word throughout the region and brought all who were sick to him and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. Hmm. And Hmm. all who touched it were healed. Isn't that interesting? So we have this picture of Jesus obeying Torah, of wearing the right thing on the fringe of his garment. And if you think about Jesus, he never says, don't follow the Torah, don't follow the tradition. What does he say it's actually the opposite. Follow which we the looked law. At. Follow Remember the, law. the commandments. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do all that the Pharisees who are on Moses' seat tell you to do. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is very much a Jewish teacher mm-hmm. wearing the Jewish clothes, doing the Jewish thing. And so when we talk about him being an insider, mm-hmm. talking to insiders, Jesus is very much a part of their culture, which I think is really important when we think about any critique that Jesus then offers, because it kind of reminds me of times where I've been frustrated with something with my family and I talk to a friend about that, that's fine. But what happens when the friend starts saying, oh yeah, your dad is such and such yeah, or no. whatever, right? Uh-uh, no. Uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> <don't fly>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You know, it's okay for us to offer critique, mm. but then when someone outside of that offers critique, it's like, ah, mm. I don't know about that. Mm. Right. I think about that in a marriage context, too. That's a <laughs> yeah. whole different conversation, <laughs> right? right. Yep. If you're talking to your wife, and she's talking to you about feedback about your feedback. You know, <laughs> relationship, and then someone says, you know, I agree. I actually oh. also think your wife needs to nod, bro. Mm. <laughs> That's right. Slow up. Yeah. That's right. Pause right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so as Jesus is critiquing them, he's part of the family, and I think that's that mm. should be a caution for us. Because we talk about the Pharisees a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They show up over a hundred times in the New Testament. So we're going to mention them. We're going to read about mm-hmm. them. We're going to talk about them a lot. But we're not insiders talking to insiders, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. that's important. A few more hints uh, from the New Testament about the Pharisees. This is in Mark chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. Uh, if someone could read that for us. And it just gives us a, a little bit more of a picture of who they were and what they did. Now, when the Pharisees... And some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him. They noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. What jumps out to you in that? Cleanliness. Cleanliness. And is it just the Pharisees? Uh, some of the scribes. No, it says, and, uh, and all the Jews. And all the Jews. Okay. So sometimes the Pharisees get picked on a little bit in the uh. New Testament, but actually it's really hard sometimes to know what just is Pharisaical mm-hmm. and what is common Jewish practice. Mm-hmm. There you go again, Pharisaical. Is that a positive or a negative mm-hmm. adjective? Right. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I think, too, it's important that you're bringing out the insider versus outsider, for, I think, for a couple of reasons. Like, one, there's been a lot of anti-Semitism that has yeah. been inflamed yes. through outsider critique that has not appreciated the fact that this is a inner Jewish debate happening. Mm. And so that there's a certain level of, I would say, just basic assumption that they're sharing with each other Mm -hmm. that wasn't shared on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so that's been harmful. Yeah. Randy Richards led us through a series one time on what goes without being said in the Bible, because all the cultural norms, they would know Mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we have to try to fill those in. And oftentimes we fill them in with the wrong things Mm because we put our cultural norms in there. So it's the same, same kind of thing there. And speaking of stereotypes, typically who makes the stereotype? The inside group? (laughs) No. No. It's usually the outside group. If the inside group is making the stereotype, it's called a brand. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah. The other thing that jumps out to me in this Mark passage is the mention of the tradition of the elders. Mm. And that's really important because that was one thing in particular that the Pharisees held on to. And they got critiqued from others at times. Of They had a high value for the oral tradition, for the tradition of the elders, for what had been passed down. Mm -hmm. So as we talked about last week, stereotypes can be helpful at times but they're incomplete and often they're outsiders talking about a group of people 
and Jesus was an insider talking to insiders. So perhaps that's a good caution for us as we keep moving forward, looking at some insider conversations and looking specifically at a few more named Pharisees in the story. All right, so now we are into part two of this study of the Pharisees. And as Daniel said, we will be meeting a few more Pharisees in this episode who in some ways break the mold, break the stereotype, and actually have a positive role in the story of the New Testament. And I think that insider-outsider perspective is one that we will find helpful. So next, we're going to meet one of the most highly respected Pharisees at the time of Jesus. But would the other Pharisees still respect him if he publicly came out with a strategy for dealing with Jesus' followers that sounded almost sympathetic? And did this Pharisee end up following Jesus himself? Well, let's listen and find out who he is, explore some of his story, and then take note of his wise words of challenge. Let's read Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 40, and meet another named Pharisee in the story. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. There's a lot of they's here. Yeah, <laughs> so they heard this, meaning the council. Okay. Mm-hmm. They were enraged and wanted to kill them, meaning Peter and the apostles. Got it. Mm-hmm. Okay. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. And then he said to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. They were convinced by him. And when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So you kind of asked already a little bit. Rasul, but context. Right. So what's the context here for this story? So this is, I believe, when John and Peter were preaching at the temple and then they healed a man, a beggar there, and it caused this big stir because of the sign of them healing, the, mm-hmm. them proclaiming Jesus, which at this point is just still weeks after the crucifixion of Jesus that was ordered by many Pharisees and participated in by the Roman government. And so all this is still very hot. And in the midst of all this, the council gets together and tries to figure out what they're going to do with Mm -hmm. John and Peter, who they've apprehended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the story you're talking about is in chapter three and four. So Peter and John are brought before the council. And at the end of that time, they're told, never preach on this again. Right. Stop preaching on it. Fast forward a little forward. So it was a great backdrop. And we get to this story. Did they stop preaching about Jesus? Mm-mm. No. <laughs> we got to obey God rather than people. Yep. Yeah. And they've also healed. They've been healing people. So we see that in chapter 5, verse 12. Mm-hmm. Many signs and wonders were done among the people through the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico, so attached to the temple. And so that's where we get this setting where they've already warned them once, don't preach about this. Stop doing the thing. (laughs) They keep doing it. And as a result, Peter and the apostles are being questioned for spreading the story about Jesus, even though they told them not to. Now, what are some of the reasons they would tell them not to preach about this? Well, I noticed that in 4 and 5, you see the Sadducees mentioned several times explicitly. And we know, even though it's we don't want to overgeneralize, but Mm -hmm. as a generality, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, mm-hmm. which is why they were sad, you see. <laughs> we had we couldn't go through the whole one. Right. No, we had to say that every time. Every time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in um, any case, so I would imagine that they would have been particularly offended by 
this teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's one, one layer. What else? I just think the whole idea, even what we've been talking about, this instability, the fear Mm -hmm. of another revolt, the swaying of people during that time, just wanting to try to maintain some kind of control. Yeah. Yeah. And the Pharisees haven't changed just because Jesus is dead Mm. and raised from the dead. I mean, they still think their job is to protect the law Mm -hmm. and do it right. Yeah. There was still a group of them that disagrees with Jesus and disagrees with his followers and are trying to stop the momentum of that theological movement within Judaism. And Mm -hmm. Vivian, as you talked about, the Romans had just killed Jesus and put a plaque above his head that said King of the Jews. So the Mm -hmm. Romans, regardless of what else Rome was doing, they were stopping a potential revolt, right? Jesus is a Galilean. That's where revolts start in this in this period, <laughs> in this time. Yeah. And so regardless of the theological issues, Pilate and the Romans could care less about that. But what they did want to make sure with was there was no unrest. So when we see this unrest start, we got to prevent another revolt as another layer to it. So it's faith related, right? We disagree. It's politically related revolt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who steps up? Gamaliel. Yeah. Now, this is a pretty long Mm -hmm. speech that we're given by what? A Pharisee. A Pharisee, (laughs) a named Pharisee in the story. And he's a hero to the Jewish people. We see that here at the beginning, but there's some other evidence as well that he was very much a hero. He's respected by all the people and he becomes kind of a hero to Christianity Mm -hmm. at this point. And we'll talk about that more in a second. There's a quote from rabbinic tradition that shows how much he was respected. Would someone read that for us? It says, when Rabban Gamliel, the elder, died, the glory of the law ceased, and purity and abstinence died. Yeah, so a very big statement, but what do you pull from that statement? A lot of honor and almost above the law. Yeah, so someone who really modeled Mm -hmm. to them this is what it looks like to be a faithful mm-hmm. Torah observer in this mm-hmm. culture at this time and to lead the people in the right way. He's mentioned twice in the New Testament here and then where else? Paul references mm-hmm. him as his teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's we're going to see that yep. teaching. And it's interesting. I mean, it is a long passage from him, but he exudes so much wisdom like Mm -hmm. he draws from the past he just speaks in a way that's palatable Mm -hmm. his words carried weight and so i imagine that for him to be able to sway people that were enraged and wanted to kill the men to think otherwise i've been in rooms before where there has been someone a voice of reason yeah a voice Uh of reason Mm -hmm. who really carries weight in their words, and it really can shift people's perspectives. I'm struck by the historicity of all of this. You mm-hmm. know, the fact that you can go and Google Gamaliel today and see mm-hmm. the significant role that he played in Judaism, right? Yep. And then in the context of the speech, he name drops yep. mm-hmm. a few people who he basically makes the point yeah. hey, these men rose up and they tried to say that they were representing God in their movements. Those movements fizzled out, they died and people moved on. But then he makes this really interesting, like at the end where he says, if God is in this, then we might be opposing God, which is like, whoa, wait, slam the brakes. (laughs) You're leaving open the possibility Mm. that the Jesus movement may be of God. That doesn't sound like the Pharisee concept Mm. that I would think of someone that was so highly respected Mm -hmm. in that role yeah that's good he was like hey guys like we need to be really careful here Mm -hmm. because now maybe he didn't think that it was of god but he's definitely leaving the room for god to surprise him and the council Mm -hmm. and work it a way that they didn't expect Mm -hmm. which is really surprising when we're thinking of who a pharisee (laughs) right Right. and i think there's something here too with the value of age and being a seasoned leader. Mm, that's good. I think in mm-hmm. our society right now, we are we just worship youth so much, but there is something about having been around and seasoned counsel, and here he's presenting this as well. So there's this godly wisdom that comes from sagacity, wisdom through experience. And it, it's surprising to me for him to emphasize the fact that God could work in a way that surprises everybody in that Mm. room because these are like the Jewish religious leaders Mm. in a room together and for him to be that kind of voice of reason is very surprising to me. Don't you think it reflects and Vivi you've said it well when you talk about the wisdom of age 
But as we age, and I've seen this modeled in Mark DeHaan or in Haddon mm-hmm. Robinson or in Alice Matthews or in Bill, the lines of black and white that are so strict, mm-hmm. you know, when we're first creating and understanding foundations of our faith, we become more comfortable with the possibilities Mm -hmm. that God may understand things we never will, and that he may have drawn them a bit more blurried. And we can hold that Mm -hmm. with an uncompromising faith Mm -hmm. because it's in God's character. Mm -hmm. One thing I think would be helpful to think about with Gamaliel, because we're going to talk about Paul here in a couple conversations. And Paul at first takes on a very different approach than Gamaliel Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. because there's kind of two responses within Phariseeism to moments like this. One is the softer edge, which is what we see modeled here, which Mm -hmm. is, you know what? I'm going to live faithfully before God. I'm going to invite my students to live faithfully for God. I'm going to encourage the community to live faithfully for God. But if people don't, then I can't help that. That's the softer edge. The harder edge, which could potentially come out of the school of Shemaiah and is a term that we often see throughout the New Testament of zealot, Mm. is the idea that I'm going to faithfully live Torah and I'm going to make you faithfully live Torah too. (laughs) Like I'm going to put a lot of pressure on you. There might be some violence. We might overthrow a foreign government because of the fact that you're making it so hard for us to live faithfully. Mm. And if we're going to be vindicated by God, it's because we're going to bring his kingdom and we're going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so we have those two different responses. And here we have Gamaliel, who really represents that softer, wiser, older edge of Pharisaism, which is openness to God. Let's ask questions. Let's look at the past, as you Mm -hmm. mentioned, Vivian, which is very Pharisaical, to look at the past and Mm -hmm. see what tradition would say. I think that simultaneously it's helpful to value and even, you know, respect the the tensions that Jesus and his followers brought to the Pharisees mm-hmm. in terms of holding on to tradition and even navigating space for their people, while at the same time kind of sitting with the reality that, I mean, the disciples did end up getting flogged after mm-hmm. oh, yeah. preaching Jesus, right? Yeah. And even still being rebuked. And what does that mean to be in a tradition and a a space of leadership that kind of pressures you to maybe miss Jesus. And I, and I think on a particular Mm. level, for example, how sometimes at the church, like I think about different music trends, right? There was a time and still in some places where (laughs) drums or, uh, I remember, you know, being a big, you know, part of and fan of Christian hip hop and how yeah. there were people that would say that is not of God mm. because that's worldly and, mm. and ended up really pushing people away mm. from <laughs> faith that could have invited. And, you know, and that's a story throughout time, whether it's rock, whether mm-hmm. it's jazz, whether it's right. whatever, right. and just on the music side. And so I think that there's still a that tension, tension yeah. mm. that we can learn from and, and even be in a sobering way, be, yeah. be reminded of what we can miss. Mm. Now, we have no indication if Gamaliel ultimately believes in Jesus or not. There is a legend in church history that he did. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, he's a saint, which is interesting. But obviously, he played a very positive role in the story. Mm -hmm. And he also, Rasul, to your point, offers us a challenge that I think is worth considering and letting the weight of that to sit on us. Because God can and often does work in ways we don't expect. Mm. And Gamaliel leaves the door open for that. And if we're not open to God's ability to surprise us and to work in ways we don't expect, we could actually set ourselves up to fight against God. And that's a sober warning, I think, for all of us. And so as we think about our phrase talking about stereotypes, (laughs) stereotypes could be helpful at times. Maybe they are, but they're at least incomplete. Mm -hmm. And here is definitely a place where the stereotype of who we expect the Pharisees to be breaks down when we meet Gamaliel. An important and maybe surprising bit of wisdom from this Pharisee about being open to God working in ways that we don't expect. Gamaliel left the door open for that, and so should we. Well, next, here on the Discover the Word podcast, Daniel and Rasul and Elisa and Vivian will pause to look at one of the first really formal debates between early Christians. And I think we'll see how those first followers of Jesus were influenced by the Pharisees in more ways than one. Jews and Gentiles together as followers of Christ? How is that going to work? 
That conversation is the next part of our study of the Pharisees. And hey, did you know that by listening to our conversations here on the Discover the Word podcast or by sharing the Our Daily Bread devotional or any of the other resources from Our Daily Bread Ministries, that you're helping to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible accessible and understandable to people across the globe. You really are. That is our mission. And so let me ask you to consider joining us in telling the story of Jesus by visiting discovertheword.org and clicking on the Donate tab up at the top of the page. We are so thankful for those who partner with us financially. And so next, Daniel is going to point us to a couple more instances that help us see some Pharisees in a light that will be outside the stereotype of the militantly anti-Jesus members of this sect. And he starts by asking Elisa and Rasul and Vivian to do something that we don't normally recommend. So I want to do something that we always say we shouldn't do when reading the Bible. I want to read one verse out of context all by itself. Okay. <laughs> Go, it's Daniel. the fortune um, cookie version. Yeah. I know. So, I love that. Yeah, I love Luke that. Luke 13, verse 31. Would somebody read that for us? At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. We won't spend too much time on this story, but what jumps out to you? Feels like an echo to me. You know, when Jesus was first born, Mm -hmm. uh, an angel came to Joseph in a dream and said, get away from here, (laughs) go Mm -hmm. go to Egypt for the another Herod wants to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. So it's very powerful. And then it's very powerful too, that it's a Pharisee, a group of Pharisees saying this. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a little line right after the Egypt story where Joseph and Mary are coming back. Mm -hmm. And it says that Joseph heard that Herod's son Mm -hmm. was in power. Mm -hmm. So they decided not to go a certain way (laughs) because they thought that'd be a threat. So Jesus's life is kind of marked by tension with the Herods. Yeah, the Herods, threats Mm -hmm. from the Herods. That's right. And what do the Pharisees do? A group of Pharisees. Mm. They protect him, which is... Very, again, how we've been talking about, if we stereotype Pharisees to be the bad guys, Mm -hmm. here they were Mm -hmm. actually doing something to protect the life of Jesus. And there's other ways that people have interpreted this. Some have said that, well, they're probably not trying to protect him. They're just probably trying to get him out of Jerusalem or get him away so they don't have to deal with him anymore. But there's other places where we see them ask Jesus a question or say something to Jesus, and Jesus responds kind of in a unique way. Mm -hmm. What was that? There are clearly moments where they ask him a question to trap him Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or to test him. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, we clearly see Jesus acknowledges it and responds according to the inner motivation, not the outward question. But Mm -hmm. here, Jesus Mm -hmm. actually responds and starts to riff about how Herod is a fox and yep. all these things. And so That's he seems huh? to take okay. the warning at face value. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I think of all of the New Testament writers, I think Luke portrays the Pharisees in a positive way. The most positive. The most yeah. positive mm. of the mm. writers. And we'll see that again because a lot of people believe that Luke and Acts are written by the same, same guy, same mm-hmm. guy, Luke. Mm-hmm. But it might have even been one manuscript at one point where they were linked together. Mm. So let's fast forward to Acts and we'll jump into the middle of a story and then we'll go backwards and talk through what's happening here. So Acts 15 verses 4 through 5. See another group of Pharisees show up. When they, Paul and Barnabas, came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. This is such a rich example of all we're discovering about Mm -hmm. the Pharisees. Some believers who belong to the sect of the Pharisees. Okay, Mm -hmm. so that means they're believers, Mm -hmm. but they're still Pharisees. And Mm -hmm. we've been saying all along that Pharisees really have a passion for the law Mm -hmm. of God's commands. They stood up and say, you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ordered to keep the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like new territory. It's brand new. We're trying to interpret doctrine here Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. This whole study, these conversations we've been doing helps me back up and look at the motivation, not necessarily the conclusion, Mm -hmm. 
but the motivation. It's like the lens through which they're trying to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a perspective that they have on what it means to keep the law, to keep Mm -hmm. the tradition. So there's also a desire for the Gentiles to really understand and to keep the law so that they also might be vindicated by God. So there's, yeah, there's so much more going on here maybe than we originally Mm. see. One of the other things that's really interesting too is because in the past there were invitations from people outside of Judaism, Gentiles, to be invited into following Judaism. And often that required circumcision. And the Pharisees in particular were very open to people outside of Judaism becoming Jews Mm -hmm. um, to follow the Jewish faith. And so there was kind of some thought about, well, how does that work? What does that look like? But it's typically smaller numbers. Mm -hmm. And yet Paul and Barnabas are coming back (laughs) from a missionary journey where what's happening? Thousands are responding. Yeah. Yeah. This is a new reality, a good problem, Mm -hmm. but a new challenge of how do we stay faithful to the law that has been handed down Mm -hmm. as from God and to be kept with this current circumstance of people who we never really thought that deeply about what how it would apply to them namely the gentiles Mm -hmm. coming into the faith and what's their relationship to the law Mm -hmm. yeah and it goes back to something we were talking about last week in particular the kind of pressures that the jewish people were Mm -hmm. living under so foreign rule the influence of Greek culture saying, here's a different set of values and things that you can live by. And so we talked about how the Jewish people were trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean to be a Jew Mm -hmm. in the midst of a culture and a government that is anything but Jewish? Now the question's starting to shift a little bit in Acts where it's like, (laughs) okay, how much of Judaism do you need to still be a part of the way? Is it a completely Jewish thing? Is it not? Where, Where do we fit in here? And that's kind of what they're trying to figure out. So they end up forming what? The Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council. And that term council, Mm. when do we usually see that showing up in the story? With the Pharisees. The Mm -hmm. Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of the law, right? They're trying to figure out what do we do about this new thing or what does it look like to live out the faith in everyday life? So they form this council. And then what do they do? What happens at the council? Well, this is like about in verse six or so, they form this, the apostles and elders meet, they discuss it, and Peter gets up and chats. And I'm struck by verse eight and nine, because we just talked about the miraculous things that were happening in the thousands of people. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them. Mm -hmm. for he purified their hearts Mm -hmm. by faith. There's this wild cracking open of their understanding Mm. of what it, maybe even what we were talking about earlier Mm. about that Jesus has fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. And now it's about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I noticed as you were reading that, one of the words that jumped out was us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Peter talking about us and them, Mm -hmm. because Peter the apostles, right? Jewish people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. This version of Jewishness called the way, right? Right. It hasn't been called Christianity yet. So it's like this new, what does it mean to be Jewish and follow Jesus as the Messiah is kind Mm -hmm. of the core question. And so they land on one thing, which is circumcision and the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. But why would those types of things be important to the Pharisees in particular, based on what we've seen? I think they believed that God had revealed himself through the law and what it meant for them to remain distinct from the Mm -hmm. worldly culture around them was to follow it. Right. And so there's this aspect of continuity of remaining faithful, Mm -hmm. but then there's this aspect of discontinuity of things changing because God is broken in, in a new way Mm -hmm. and through Jesus and Mm -hmm. now through the sharing of the gospel. And that tension is what we see. And interestingly enough, you know, if we go down a little bit further, it says when they finished, meaning Paul and Barnabas telling about all that God did. And it says the whole assembly was silent as they were listening. When they finished, James rose up and said, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. And then he says, this is in agreement with the prophets. Mm -hmm. And he quotes Amos Mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, pointing to this time when the Gentiles will hear and bear God's name. And so the appeal in a very pharisaical (laughs) way (laughs) is to go back to the scripture, go back to the text. Mm -hmm of the prophecy of the Old Testament to point to the expectation that this was yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think I love that the idea here is that they're 
is still the desire to be set apart. There mm -hmm. is the desire right. to honor that. So the decision that they land on is, hey, let's make sure that they're not eating food that's been sacrificed to idols. Mm -hmm. There's still a distinction, mm. though not with necessarily circumcision. Mm. And even later in Acts 9, Peter is presented with the sheet with all the food, like mm -hmm. eat everything now. So there's kind of this morphing, but again, it's like coming back to the centrality of we're saved by grace through faith that's in right. Jesus. And we do need to walk set apart. So that's for mm -hmm. us in our everyday that I think between us and the Lord, what does it mean for us to be set apart as followers of Christ in our day and age? It may look differently, but I do think that there needs to be things that are different about mm. us. If Jesus says we're salt and light, what does that mean? And I think with the Gentiles, they would want to outwardly show that they are different than they were before. And we're going to yep. see that, you know, as it should go on in, into the New Testament. And you see how Paul and John and others describe what makes a Christian a Christian, mm -hmm. what makes you unique. It's the fruit of the Spirit these external characteristics that make us look like Jesus. It's our hope, you know, the fact that perseverance leads to character mm. and character hope. It's so different. And in addition, and I'm going back to the middle of this passage we've been looking at, where it's Peter who's preaching to everybody, you know, in verse 10 and, and 11, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor mm -hmm. our ancestors That's have right. been able to bear? We That's couldn't right. do it. Mm -hmm. No, we believe it's through grace the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are saved just as they are. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that takes us full circle to yeah. the non-stereotype thing. So like one, the Pharisees that are mentioned here are in the council, in the community, in the of way, Christians. in yeah. the way, they're, they're the in the way, yeah. but they're also somewhat in the way. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean no. oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> I love that. They're, they're both in the community, in yep. the way, but they also, That's good. they're old assumptions yep. about what makes you yes. righteous is still bumping up bumping against, up against yeah, this good. new revelation. That's right. And that's kind of this interesting tension you see here in the passage too. How do they respond once James and Peter say all this? They became silent. And then they agree. That's everybody. Everybody's silent. The whole assembly. And then nowhere does it say that they later were like, no guys. Yeah. Or push back again. So there's a, a sense in which at least the way that Luke is presenting the story in Acts that they're like, all right, this is what the council's decided. Like this is what we're going to do. And so continuing as believing Pharisees, they're going to follow this authority of speaking of a word that we're uncomfortable with, as we <laughs> talked about before, of Peter and James and the council. And so as we think about Pharisees, in Luke, we have an example of the Pharisees warning Jesus and protecting him. In Acts, we have a group of believing Pharisees who belong to the way, who follow Jesus, trying to figure out what this looks like to follow him. This council forms, trying to figure out what does it mean to be this Jewish way Jesus follower mm -hmm. in our modern time and place. And as we think about that, that's the legacy that all of us step into every day as we mm -hmm. ask the questions, well, what does it mean to follow Jesus today yeah. in this modern time and place? What does it look like to distance ourselves from the idols that are around us and the temptations that mm -hmm. we have? And when we ask those questions, we're being very pharisaical when mm -hmm. we ask those <laughs> types of questions. Because as we talked about, stereotypes, maybe they're helpful sometimes. I don't know. I'm starting to doubt whether they're ever helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but we know that they're at least incomplete. Mm -hmm. And for these two groups of Pharisees, it definitely seems that the stereotype is incomplete because one group follows Jesus and the other protects him. couple more references to the Pharisees in the New Testament and a more positive impact on the story than maybe we would expect. And now in the last two parts of this conversation, we're going to focus on the role a Pharisee had in the worldwide establishment of the Christian church and a role he continues to play in your faith and the way you live out your faith in Jesus. We have one major collection of writings from a second temple Pharisee. Second temple meaning the time that Jesus was on the earth, a little bit before, a little bit after, but when he was there. We have one major collection of writings from a Pharisee of that time. Who was it? Yeah, it's kind of surprising, isn't it, that there's just one? And so we will find out who he is when this episode of the Discover the Word podcast continues 
in just a moment. Now, Discover the Word is just one of the ways that Our Daily Bread Ministries provides resources to help you engage the Scriptures on a regular basis. At our core, we are a Bible engagement ministry. And during the series, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about another resource, one from our Our Daily Bread Publishing group that may be a good complement to the study that we're doing. It's called Encounters with Jesus, a book written by our co-worker here at the ministry, J.R. Hudberg. J.R. is the executive editor of our Discovery series of Bible study booklets that I've told you about in the past. Well, J.R. has written a book that focuses on some of the different types of encounters that people had with Jesus, from believers to skeptics and even scoffers. They were all presented with a choice. And so next time you're online, I invite you to learn more about this choice by getting a copy of the book, Encounters with Jesus. You can get a copy by visiting OurDailyBreadPublishing.org. And then once you're there, you can use the search bar found at the top of the page and type in Encounters with Jesus at OurDailyBreadPublishing.org. All right, and now my guess is you likely can venture a pretty good guess on who this prominent Second Temple era Pharisee might be that we'll be focusing on the last two parts of this study. But uh, let's listen to how Elisa and Rasul and Vivian answer Daniel's question and then explore how this Pharisee had a positive impact. We have one major collection of writings from a Pharisee of that time. Who was it? I believe he's known as Saul of Tarsus. Or <laughs> the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Paul, yeah. That's a game changer, Daniel, Which is for really me. Interesting, it's just isn't like it? reframe so much to mm-hmm. remember. Because I think I know that as a part of his history, but that really did shape his thinking, the way he navigated life. And I think part of what we'll see in these next two conversations is that he claims it several strategic times mm-hmm. and talks about that. So let's look at the first one, Acts 22, verse 3. So would somebody read Acts 22, verse 3 for us. Sure. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, being zealous for God, just as all of you are today. So what's the context for Acts 22? This is one of the trials that takes place after Paul is arrested Mm -hmm. for disturbances that people accuse him of defiling the temple. And so he's brought up on these charges and eventually given the opportunity to speak in his own defense. Yep. Paul shows up in Jerusalem and James and the elders warn him that there's some lies that are being spread about him. And we'll see that in just a second. First, would somebody read Acts 21 verse 20 as we start building this context? When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them are zealous for the law. So what jumps out to you there? Believers, thousands of believers and still zealous for the law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we can just assume, we don't know for sure, but there's probably a lot of Pharisees mm-hmm. in that group because it was a pretty influential group at the time, especially when we see the phrase zealous for the law. Now, zealous is a word that should jump out to us because we've talked a lot about the culture and this time. And what is that word often connected to? Zeal. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, The zealots uh, who wanted to physically Mm -hmm. oppose and overthrow Rome. Mm -hmm. Like zeal kind of almost has this negative connotation Mm -hmm. sometimes, but not really. Like it means like passion. It does. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. And so like. Zealous is like they're they're serious. They bought this life, as, mm-hmm. as we say. Like mm-hmm. they, they, you know, they're not lukewarm. They're, yeah. They're, yeah, they're on fire. Super passionate. There have been some revolts that some zealots have caused. Let's read verses twenty one through twenty two. This is where James and the elders start explaining to Paul. There's been some lies spread about you. You should know about this as you come back into town. Mm. Somebody read that for us. They have been told about you that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, and that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Oof. For a group of believing Jews that are zealous for the law, if they've heard that description of Paul, how do you think they feel about him? Well, he feels like a betrayer, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. like he's, you know, he's not to be trusted. So what's the idea they come up with to show that no, maybe there's more to Paul than you think. They're going to do this purification right that, according to the law, would show their 
commitment to cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would allow Paul to then be able to go into the temple again because he's been in Gentile places. Mm -hmm. And he joins four other guys that are, we think, taking on a Nazarite vow because of the shaving of their head, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So believers who are taking on a Nazarite vow... Now, this doesn't quite work, though. What ends up happening? You go down a few verses later, and you see that folks stirred up the crowd and said, hey, this is the guy over here pointing to Paul who is turning all the people against the law in the temple. Mm -hmm. And so let's seize him. And then basically a riot breaks Mm -hmm. out and them dragging Paul through the temple. Yeah, a riot breaks out. That should jump out to us as well, right? Mm Because we've talked about the culture at this time and how unstable it was and Mm -hmm. things like that. Yep, so this tribune goes, they grab Paul, they arrest him, they're bringing him back to the barracks. Paul speaks in Greek to them, and what does that mean for them? They realize something about Paul, or maybe (laughs) something that's not... not, (laughs) You're not Egyptian? (laughs) Yeah, he's not Egyptian, because they they mistook him for someone who had recently stirred up a revolt. So... That's where it was like he's speaking Greek and and then Paul is like, no, I'm actually Jewish. I'm a Jew from Tarsus. So when we talked about like revolts Hmm. being tense, like this being a tense time and revolts Mm -hmm. happening, how many stories have we seen? Gamaliel mentioned two revolts. Here Mm -hmm. we have a revolt here, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is a thing Mm -hmm. at this time. Yeah, they're waiting Um, for the next one. And we're in the midst of one, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Right. In this this chapter. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So there's instability here. There's Jewish believers who are zealous for the law. There's believers who seem to be taking on a Nazarite vow. All of these are believers, which is so interesting. Mm -hmm. So Paul's a student of Gamaliel. Why do you think Paul, when he finally gets the chance to talk to his brothers and sisters, why would he start off with that, do you think? Well, he's so respected. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to one of our prior conversations in Acts 5, Gamaliel stands up and kind of calms everybody Mm -hmm. down. And, you know, this is the kind of influence. We we were talking about in our conversation about Gamaliel, about his wisdom Mm -hmm. and his aged wisdom. And if Paul was mentored by that kind of a rabbi, that's a big deal. It's like, not only is he pointing to him as one of his references, Mm -hmm. but I think his character probably also modeled some of Mm. Gamaliel's character. At least after meeting Jesus. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting, right, is is Paul actually goes the opposite from Gamaliel at first by becoming zealous, which he's... He said in the verse we started Mm -hmm. off with, but now seems to be going the other direction. And he tells his story. Yeah. Yep. Mm. So talks about his pedigree and his zeal as a connecting point. Why is that important for this group of people listening? Just to establish credibility. Yeah. And it's that we had another conversation talking about Jesus speaking to the Pharisees as an insider. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. Paul is claiming that inside turf too. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking in Aramaic. You know, so they get quiet. But then he also says brothers and fathers, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is another interesting relational connection that Mm -hmm. he's making. Yep. So, guys, I'm one of you. Not only am I one of you, but I was trained by the person we all respect the most, Gamaliel, right? So, and you're all zealous. I was zealous too. I am zealous, right? Mm -hmm. So he's addressing them by claiming those pieces of his pedigree that help him relate to the crowd. And then in his speech, he talks about another Jewish man. And look at the way he describes this person. So who is it? Verse 12 of chapter 22. And what does he say about him? It's Ananias. Mm -hmm. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law Mm -hmm. and highly respected by all the Jews living there. And he stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Mm. And he goes on and it describes how God revealed himself to him. Mm-hmm. And notice the phrase, the God of our ancestors mm-hmm. has chosen you to know his will. So Paul talks about his own pedigree. He leans on Gamaliel's reputation. And when he describes Ananias as a part of his conversion story of mm-hmm. getting his sight back after the Damascus road, he talks about him being a devout man, according to the law, <laughs> spoken of well by all the Jews living there. And what does Ananias' speech say? The God of our ancestors. So Again, there's just this very clear connecting point that Paul's making. He's drawing attention to these things. So far from throwing off Judaism, Paul and Ananias both, as they see everything that's happening with them and with Jesus and with the Jesus movement, see it as a continuation of the story Mm. that they're already living in. And this isn't the only place that Paul describes his pedigree and holds on to it. We did a series on Philippians. Mm. And in Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about this as well. Would somebody read about halfway through verse four through verse six of chapter three. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yeah. So in this context, what is Paul talking about in Philippians 3? Do you remember from our series? It's a thank you note to the Philippians for their support. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. they're so near and dear to his heart. And he's kind of leaning on exactly what we talked about in our last conversation of there's all these Gentiles that are influxing in. So how do we still be Jewish, but Mm -hmm. also grow together? And what does that mean for the Gentiles and things like that? And so then he goes into this kind of speech in chapter three, specifically talking about a group of people that want Gentiles to take on all Mm -hmm. of the law. That's Mm -hmm. right. And add to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he's saying in that context too, guys, I'm one of you. Yeah. Now, as we think about the Pharisees in particular and Paul mentioning this pedigree and all that we've learned so far in eight, almost nine conversations, (laughs) what jumps out to you about the way Paul describes himself? I think it's fascinating still. And this is really popping every time I look at a passage now, Daniel, is that he describes himself as a Pharisee, Mm -hmm. as one obedient to the law, an expert in the law. And when I look at that, I constantly think that was before he came to know Jesus, but he still does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you point us to Philippians 3, clearly kind of mentions this in the past tense in regards to the law of Pharisee and obviously in the context of him pushing up against those who were trying to get people to remain under circumcision, especially Gentiles. How do you think about that? The fact that on one end, there's this identification and we see and acts him showing ties and closeness. But then on the mm-hmm. other end, he's in Philippians 3. I think you can make the case he is talking more about the past versus the present. Well, where does he go with it? He makes it a comparison game, right? Compared to all that pedigree. Mm-hmm. Right. The sake of Christ is more worthy. Right. Yes. And so it doesn't That's say that he's throwing it away mm-hmm. as much as he's saying that what I care about most now is not the pedigree that makes me one of us. Mm-hmm but that I have something that I'm living for that's even more. Mm. So that's what I see maybe happening there. But then notice how he ends. Skip down to verse 11, and what's kind of the point? And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Yeah, so what group (laughs) was known for (laughs) believing in the resurrection of the dead? Pharisees. 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 So in a way, what Paul's saying as he builds through this is regardless of how strongly he holds on to that compared to following Christ, Mm. is he at least sees his Pharisaism setting him up to believe in the resurrection from the dead, Mm. which now he sees in one person, which is who? Jesus. Jesus. And I'm I'm thinking of his words elsewhere, to live is Christ, Mm -hmm. to die is gain. He kind of sums it up. So, because I'm thinking through Romans, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That Paul's training as a Pharisee was helpful in helping him get to the place, thinking of Romans 2 and 3 in particular, realizing that because all have fallen short of the glory of God, all can't be justified through the law, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that the law is bad, but it points us to Christ, points Mm -hmm. us to our need for Christ. And yet there's still some value in understanding that God did reveal us some things that are true and he's holding all that together. And Mm -hmm. if you go on into Romans six and seven, Hmm. you know, it's the law that holds us accountable, but we can't keep the law. Right. But now Mm -hmm. that we have the resurrection of Jesus, we have hope. And so Mm -hmm. we still can live towards the law by his power. So then Romans eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing can separate us. Mm -hmm. For those who are in Christ Jesus. (laughs) It hits me too that in God's economy, nothing is wasted. Mm -hmm. So God used Paul's mind and his training Mm -hmm. and his relationships all for the furthering of his purpose and that would be true of Mm. each of us and all of our listeners that Mm -hmm. God has a very specific purpose for each of us and in his economy nothing is wasted you don't have to flush the half part of what God was about Mm -hmm. you know you bring it forward into fruition Yeah. yeah and I think that's probably what Paul's thinking and feeling at this point not that we can really guess that but I think as he looks at his pedigree, as he looks at what it was to be a Pharisee, he looks at that potentially the way some of us look at our backgrounds and like, man, that laid a great foundation for me in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it really helped me get to the point now where I can see things more clearly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Paul is starting to get to, that almost following Jesus is becoming the best kind of Pharisee. And I think we Mm -hmm. might even see that more in our next conversation where we're going to end, which to your conversation about Romans, we're going to end the whole series on Romans 14, which I think (laughs) will be a great place to land when we talk about the Pharisees. 
And so coming up in the last part of this conversation, they'll talk more about Paul's background as a Pharisee. And now that is a part of his story of coming to Christ and then whether Paul thought it was necessary to throw off all his Jewishness and turn his back completely on his Pharisee ways to follow Jesus. Thought-provoking take on that when we wrap up this study called The Pharisees. But first, let's take a quick peek ahead to what we'll be studying together in our next podcast. Blueberries, bananas, grapes, pomegranates, apples. What's your favorite fruit? Well, next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Elisa Morgan leads the group through a study called Fruitful Living, in which we'll be going through the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. You know, just for fun, and it really is just for fun because it's a little facetious, but I chose a, a specific physical fruit to express each of the fruit of the Spirit, kind of as a memory device for mm. us. I mean, these are not literal. I just made them up, okay? Just full right. disclosure. Yeah, but I think it will make a fun way of studying this by attaching a fruit to each of the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Be here at the table with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry. And we'll begin a two-part study called Fruitful Living on the next Discover the Word podcast. And now let's listen as Daniel addresses a question that we started to raise as we closed the last part of the conversation a moment ago about the Pharisees and the Apostle Paul. So there's a tension in what we're talking about that's really good. And I don't know if you feel it, but I've felt it the whole time during Mm -hmm. the research, which is especially talking about Paul. And we ended our last conversation talking about Philippians 3. Mm -hmm. He goes into that section of like, but I count it all as a loss. Mm -hmm. All of his past, all of his history. Now, what I think he's doing now after doing this series with you all is I think what he's doing is making a comparison Mm -hmm. and not throwing off all the Jewishness, not throwing off being a Pharisee or anything like that but that he is compared to knowing Jesus, nothing compares to knowing Mm -hmm. Jesus. So the question that I want to ask us and kind of lean into the tension is, do you think that Paul saw Christianity as an abandonment of being a Pharisee, so I have to stop being a Pharisee to follow Jesus, or as a way to be maybe even a better Pharisee in his mind? And I want to have us read a couple passages, so hold that tension, and we'll go there, okay? So first, Mm -hmm. Acts 23, verse 6, another space where he's kind of on trial between Sadducees, Pharisees. He's before the council. They're asking him lots of hard questions. Here's what Paul says in chapter 23, verse 6 of Acts. Vivian, would you read that for us? When Paul noticed that some were Sadducees and others were Pharisees, he called out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial concerning the hope of the resurrection of the dead. So he claims some membership to which school? Philosophical sect? Pharisees, Pharisees. Sadducees, yeah, Mm -hmm. Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Yep, I feel like this starts to hint at maybe he's not abandoning it altogether. Secondly, implied in this statement is him leaning into a tension between the Pharisees and Sadducees. What's the tension between the two groups? Well, the Sadducees mostly don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Mm. The Pharisees do. Yep. And he says he's on trial because of the hope Mm. of the resurrection. I just noticed in verse six, like when it says, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees called out in the Sanhedrin. I always read that as a, I guess you say, rhetorical strategy that Paul was using to create some wedge Mm -hmm. between this kind of universally formed group that was against him. But not that he was lying, (laughs) but that that was a strategic move. But I guess I've always emphasized the The strategy. um, The strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think we want to downplay that. Obviously, there's Mm -hmm. some strategy that Paul's implementing there. But his strategy includes claiming membership in Mm -hmm. one of the groups. Identifying. And the fact that he makes it about the resurrection of the dead, Mm -hmm. which is a very pharisaical belief 
And now who is his hope in the resurrection of the dead? Jesus, and Jesus. it's essential. And he'll make that so clear mm-hmm. in his letters. The belief in the resurrection is essential to and our faith. And he says, I am a Pharisee, not I was a Pharisee. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. I am a Pharisee and I'm a son of Pharisees. Right. Yeah. So there's definitely some some claiming. Mm-hmm. He's sure. still wearing the t-shirt a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yep. Let's look at another spot. Maybe this will help too. Acts 26 verses 4 through 8. Paul just keeps ending up before people having to explain himself. <laughs> uh-huh. Right. That's like a, He ends up in front of King Agrippa. In that setting, this is what he says. So Acts 26, verses 4 through 8. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, a life spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They've known for a long time, if they're willing to testify, that I belonged to the strictest sect of our religion and lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial on account of my hope and in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. It is for this hope, Your Excellency, that I am accused by Jews. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Again, do we see a throwing off of him being a Pharisee? We see a contextualization. Yeah, it's like a contextualization or applying his new belief in Jesus as the Messiah Mm -hmm. to what he believed in the past. And then he goes on to tell his story of conversion. How does it unfold? What are the Jews looking for? The Messiah. What hinted that a Messiah would come? The Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, right? So Paul sees this whole continuation in his spot as a Pharisee as the middle of the story, as a continuation of this story. So before I feel like I can even chime in or have a <laughs> informed conclusion to your question <laughs> or answer of, is Paul thinking that Christianity is an abandonment of being a Pharisee or an embodiment? Whose version or definition of Pharisee do we mean? Right. Mm. And whose version of Christianity do we mean? Right. Yeah. A Pharisee set apart. That's what mm-hmm. it meant. Right. Like in these ones mm-hmm. who were trying to hold on to being set apart by God in the law that he given him, distinguished from the culture, especially from Hellenism, from Mm -hmm. the overwhelming kind of cultural pressures of their day. I think I can, in a very broad spiritual way, see some clear connection between that. But when I think of the specific discipline and application of being as closely connected to obeying the Mosaic law as possible, then that feels like, nah, that's not Mm -hmm. what he's ultimately committed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we started this whole series talking about stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Right. All Pharisees are dot, dot, dot. What you just described shows that the stereotype doesn't hold all the time. Right. Hmm. Now there's two pieces of Pharisaism that I think let's pull on these two threads to kind of close out the series and see if it helps us a little bit too. One of the tensions between the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, the Sadducees in particular as priests in the temple had this kind of, could we even say special relationship with God, Mm -hmm. special sense of God's presence. God actually showed up in the temple is what they believed by doing these rituals, these sacrifices, they could interact with the presence of God in some way. Well, one of the things that the Pharisees cared about deeply was they saw that relationship that the Sadducees had with the presence of God. And they were like, that has to be for everybody at all places. Mm. Like it can't just be stuck in the temple. In fact, so many Jews don't even live here. Mm -hmm. They live all over the world in the diaspora. There has to be a sense in which they can also experience God's presence. And their result or conclusion was, if we live a certain way, we can experience God's presence, which Mm -hmm. is where we get some of that law. Anyway, so Paul, as a Pharisee, as someone who would have been thinking a lot about is God's presence only experienced in the temple or can it be experienced outside of that? How does he describe the church in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 17? Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and that is what you are. So Paul, a Pharisee, Mm who believes God's presence can be experienced outside of the temple, describes the church as what? The temple. God's temple. Mm -hmm. That is what you are. Mm -hmm. The very presence of God lives Mm -hmm. in you, which is a very pharisaical Mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. And then one last thread to pull on, because I'm excited about this one too. The Pharisees, what what was one of the things they were trying to figure out? How to live Torah where? Everyday life, right? In the midst of a modern culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Romans, because you all mentioned that last time, and I said we'd get there. Okay. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 8. 
Remember, they're trying to figure out, okay, what applies, what doesn't apply, how do we live this out? That's a very pharisaical thing. Here's Paul working that out, but in what we would call a Christian version of that. So Romans 14, verses 1 through 8. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So as the Pharisees would try to figure out what does it look like to live Torah in everyday life, Hmm. here's Paul taking that question and riffing on it, but in a much different way. Mm -hmm. What jumps out to you? in this passage. Worshiping God versus not. I mean, (laughs) all of these specifics or particulars, Mm. you know, depend more on the condition of our heart and why we're doing them. Mm -hmm. And we all find ourselves in this passage Mm -hmm. because whether we're the person who does the thing or doesn't do the thing, we have the tendency to judge the person who does the opposite as missing out on what God's best is for them. Mm. But the whole point, again, we live to the Lord in our modern context and whatever context we're in, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus today. It's very pharisaical (laughs) for Paul to go through that kind of process of what would it look like to live in this place in this time in a different way. So whether or not Pharisees are positive in the Christian Bible, I think is a matter of how you see the story unfolding. If we hold to the stereotypes we talked about at the beginning of the series, I think we might miss some of the really amazing ways in which the Pharisees push the story forward in a positive way. But more than that, I think what I've been most drawn to in this series was what we do on Discover the Word, what we do in Christianity, is in some ways a continuation of the best of what the Pharisees did. Uh, We're pilgrims on a journey trying to figure out what it looks like to be people Mm -hmm. of faith in our modern context. So Paul did a lot of work for us in that, Mm -hmm. right? He laid this foundation for us in Romans and many other places. Uh, What does it look like to be a God follower in the Greek world? But he didn't do all of the work for us because we have a lot of modern things that we run into that Mm -hmm. aren't addressed directly in Scripture. And so anytime we act on the belief that God wants to meet us anywhere we are, regardless of location, regardless of genealogy, whenever we ask the questions, what does it look like to live out our faith today? We're leaning into our roots as a part of a Jewish movement that believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And all of us are acting a little bit like Pharisees. And in that way, it's not a bad thing. And I hope you found that uh, helpful conversation we've had over the last couple episodes of the Discover the Word podcast about the Pharisees. They are a group that we can find fault with because of the things Jesus criticized them for and the way many of them resisted Jesus. But if we stereotype them all that way, we miss some pretty amazing ways that, as Daniel said, they push the story of Jesus and the spread of faith in him forward. So thanks for exploring that with Daniel Ryan Day, Elisa Morgan, Rasul Berry, and Vivian Mabuni on this two-part study here on Discover the Word. Discover the Word is a small group style Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures and challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ while always pointing to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And don't forget that in our next episode, we'll be studying the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Hope you'll be here at the table with us for that. And thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 